welcome to Talking Books. Born in the city of St. Petersburg, Paulina Simons has a life almost as rich as that of her latest fictional heroine, Tatiana, a young woman who falls in love with a Red Army officer and finds herself trapped during the siege of Leningrad in the novel called The Bronze Horseman. Paulina became a writer after emigrating to the United States. Her first novel, Tully, was set in Kansas and told the story of an abused young woman who's almost overcome by a teenage tragedy. It sold more than 120,000 copies in Australia alone. Two more novels followed, Red Leaves and Eleven Hours, but The Bronze Horseman is the story Paulina has always wanted to tell. Paulina, welcome to Talking Books. Thank you, Caroline. Tell me about what it was like growing up in St. Petersburg, because you were there until you were about 10 years old. Yeah. What were the living conditions in your family? My family, before I was born, lived in the two rooms that I describe in my fiction book, The, the Bronze Horseman, but we had two rooms. They were about seven square meters, but it was a room that was maybe, maybe three meters wide by perhaps seven meters long. And so very narrow, but w what happened was my grandparents lived in that room and my father lived uh, in that room with, the, with his brother. And then in the next room, my, um, my um, great grandmother lived. So and then when close. my mother and father got married, they did not live together. How they became pregnant with me, I don't know. <laughs> because they were not in the same house and then she lived with her father. My father continued to live at home, but it was when my mom became pregnant with me that they needed a place to live. And so then my grandparents were able to get a small, tiny apartment of their own. So they moved out. My uncle got one room and my mom, my dad and I got that room that I was telling you about that. Now, so we lived in that room for five years. Um, and you know, and remember, these rooms are in a communal apartment, so you've got you've got uh, nine other families sharing two bathrooms and two kitchens. I mean, it's you know, um, but then everybody lived that way. Yes, I didn't realize I was didn't. deprived or disadvantaged because that, that was just how it was. And yeah. to what extent? How aware of communism were you as a child in terms of what was taught to you at school? by way of history, propaganda? Well, we're very aware that communism was the best way of life. It was the only way of life. It was the, uh, the way of the future. And certainly the past was awful. The present was much better. And um, the propaganda against America was very intense. Not just against America, but against any, particularly against America, against any Western country. Mm -hmm. uh, capitalism was, you know, equated with the devil. So your, your father became involved in anti-communist protest when the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia. What made him decide to take a stand against that? He said before I turned five years old he didn't want to engage in any activity that would endanger his presence in my life but after that he just couldn't um, he felt very strongly about the things he did. And he was uh, with a bunch of friends who also felt as strong, so they used to meet every week. And they did really nothing except talk about um, just the conditions, the situation, smoke, drank vodka, you know, the Russian thing. But it was, as I said, a small room. And on the next, on the wall of that next room were the KGB informers that would come back and kind of report on everything that was said and done. And so my dad was warned several times to cease and desist and did not and so finally right at uh, in August of 1968 he and his uh, friends were arrested while I was in uh, in the village at the time. He then went to a gulag yeah, for two years. During the time that your father was in prison were you and your family able to stay in touch with him and were you and your family punished in any way because the head of the family had taken that stand? Um, I don't think that we were uh, punished in the fact that my, my mother continued to have the job that she had before he was arrested. We continued to live in the same rooms. I did not know he had been arrested. I thought he was on a business trip. That's what I was told. Mm. Uh, so our life, I think, I think from that point of view kind of continued. I know my grandfather, who was um, an engineer, he built ships for the Soviet naval fleet. He, uh, I think he had some trouble at work because of my, because of my dad. And 
so were you in touch with your father? Were you able to I write? A, uh, I was able to write to him. He was able to write to me. Uh, I was only five at the time, then six, then seven. Uh, did not see him for the two years he was in prison. My mother went to see him once during that time. And I did see him once when he was in the local Leningrad jail awaiting trial. So I did see him once in jail. I don't know what I must have, but I didn't think positively about that experience because I still remember it. I was yes. five years old, yeah. So how mm -hmm. difficult, Paulina, was it for your family to emigrate to the United States? And how did he manage to do that for all of you? Um, it was surprisingly, it was surprisingly not difficult. Like we weren't escapees, we weren't refugees, we didn't hide out and in safe houses or anything. We left on an Israeli visa as if we were going to Israel. Uh, my um, so my father was able to engineer that we had to denounce, you know, renounce our Soviet citizenship uh, to do that. So for a while there, we weren't citizens of any country. But we left by legal means. And once we got to Vienna, the Soviet government did not care anymore which way we went. Um, most of the immigration out of Russia actually did go on from Vienna to Israel, mm -hmm. uh, except for those who perhaps weren't Jewish and like us and who continued on either to, uh, they could continue on to England or America and we continued on to New York. And your father had done this brilliant thing in jail, hadn't he? He had taught himself English. Yes, he did. Because it was, I think when he was in jail that my father believed in America most of all. Um, that he thought that it would be, and I think when he was in jail that he must have thought that I want to give my family a, a different life. So when you got to America, what do you as a child remember most vividly about what you could suddenly have or taste or experience? Two things. Chewing gum, potato chips. That was it. Classics. Absolutely. What more does a 10-year-old child need? Chewing gum, potato chips, both things we did not have in, in Russia, in the Soviet Union. And so both these things in wild abundance <laughs> were just fantastic to me. We didn't have a lot of money. My mom wasn't working. My dad was, uh, was working, but he wasn't making a lot of money. So, you know, we never had... I mean, I'll say my sister had a better upbringing. She was born in, in America uh, years later, and my parents were better off, and they were able to make her more American. When I first came and became a teenager, they were still so Russian, painfully Russian, and my language was so Russian. I just wasn't... And my clothes, I was always hand-me-downs from somebody else, never knew. I didn't own my own pair of jeans until I was 18. And, you know, it's such a small, silly thing, but for a child who's trying to fit in, mm. it wasn't a small thing. Your ambition was to be a successful American. What do you think being a successful American meant to you? To know American culture, to speak a language without a trace of accent, to not be so... Russian. I didn't want to write about Russia. I didn't want to know about Russia. I didn't want to be Russian. I just wanted to have that kind of Californian American feel to me. And interestingly, your first book is a kind of, in a way, a quintessential American story, mm. uh, albeit about a quintessential dysfunctional mm. sort of American okay. woman. It's set in Kansas and it tackles the story of Tully a woman who has several disadvantages that she has to overcome. She has a violent and abusive mother. She has a best friend who commits suicide. Um, everything around her is in a state of complete upheaval and turmoil. Why did you want to take this as your first subject for a book when you'd made this fantastic transition to this great country? She was somebody who was very real to me. Um, and the interesting thing about her to me was her great disadvantage in being able to still make a life out of, um, out of that supreme weakness that she had to go through. Uh, and at every step of the way, she seemed to be thrown curveballs. And at every step of the way, she either avoided them or somehow squared her shoulders and went on. And uh, her strength interested me, fascinated me. I wanted to write a story about someone who was not a victim. Um, 
I, you know, and she was very strong and very, uh, this is a very vivid in my, in my imagination. Mm. But she's a difficult woman, Paulina, very. to, um, to relate to. I mean, obviously women have related to her in vast numbers, otherwise mm. the book wouldn't have become the phenomenal bestseller that it did. But you're very challenging, it seems to me, as a reader with Tully, because she's not nice all mm. the time. She's mm. not an easy woman to like. Mm -hmm. She is very abrupt. Mm -hmm. She's emotionally completely shut down. Mm -hmm. And she's fortunate enough to have a very good and very patient husband. Well, who saw in her that, that sadness and that weakness and that tenderness and he saw something in her yeah that vulnerability but she doesn't let him in she does no. not let him in she then goes off and falls in love with other people and she really at one stage in the book she really thinks that she can have her cake and eat it she did yeah, yeah. how did you pull off the trick whereby we care enough about Tully not to just slam the book shut and go you're a bitch and you deserve no. everything you get. And even later, uh, that's right, and even later where she is aghast that during her unhappy relationship and marriage with the one man who loves her unconditionally that he might have wanted some happiness for himself and yet we're completely sympathetic and understanding to her feelings like we know how can that be she deserves everything she gets she's getting her comeuppance and yet still we we feel for her yes we feel for her she was she was a handful how did wasn't you know she? that woman in your mind where does she come from i don't know we don't want to delve that far do we <laughs> <laughs> yes we do on this show we do <laughs> are we a probing show <laughs> we are <laughs> Uh, this, it always amazes me how when you love someone you're able to overlook so many things because love, unconditional love is an emotion. Listen, at the end everybody will have enough. Everybody will suddenly feel, you know what, I've had enough. But think about how many times women put up with men who are unfaithful, who don't treat them well, who don't do housework, who are not there uh, compliments who are not their perfect partners and yet when we love we love regardless of those things and what was interesting to me was the man to love and the way that women love so what do the two men in Tully represent because we've got the kind of the very patient and enduring husband mm -hmm. Robin and then we've got Jack who represents something more elusive more romantic more passionate more idealized, but is a drifter. Yes. With Jack, Tully is doing one thing and one thing only, isn't she? She is redeeming herself for her friend's death, for which she feels not only responsible, but her relationship with Jack is Jennifer's immortality. Mm -hmm. That's that's for her to bring Jennifer back from the dead. From that this, this is, yes. yeah, that this is the... She's sort of I having the relationship with Jack that Jennifer never managed to have. That never managed to have. She's, mm. yeah. Preferred. Though her feelings for him are very real, certainly, and genuine. But there's, there's all that. Now, you also give the story a very um, a tiny little Australian kind of reference. What did I say? Well, you call... Tully's son, Boomerang. Boomerang, that's right. Why on earth, given that that is not actually a real <laughs> name, I've never heard of a child called Boomerang, or even Boomer for short, as you abbreviate him. Why on earth did you call him Boomerang? How funny is that? Because that was his name. That was just his perfect name. I, I can't even imagine. That's right. Don't worry, I'll write a book about Australia. That'll be next. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, talking about next, you then went on to write two books, um, yeah. Red Leaves and Eleven, um, Eleven Hours, yeah. both of which focus on crimes. Were you thinking after Tully that you wanted to shift into the genre of crime fiction or thriller writing specifically? No. Uh, n no. What interested me after Tully was to write something completely different from Tully because Tully was very emotionally draining to write and I couldn't imagine writing and feeling for something else along the same lines, the same scope. Uh, that was difficult for me. What interested me about Red Leaves was the story of premeditated murder. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's what interested me. It interested me to peel the layers off people that we know and expose suddenly 
these abnormal things, these amoral things, mm. these un evil, unusual things. That's what interested me in that story. And in 11 Hours, what interested me there was the the pregnant woman, the, the, the fear that all women have that something is going to go desperately wrong and there will be nothing they can do about it. So that was like everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong in this woman's life yes. and, and how she comes to deal with it. But then you've shifted gear and after all those years of not wanting to be associated with anything Russian, Russian you were obviously in denial, as we Absolutely. say in America, <laughs> um, you finally succumbed and, um, and wrote The Bronze Horseman and I gather it took you four years to write. Why did you call it um, The Bronze Horseman, which refers to Pushkin's most famous poet? I called it the Bronze Horseman because the themes in Pushkin's poem and also the meaning for the statue that stands in Leningrad and the meaning to my story were running all parallel with one another and I thought that it was the perfect title for the things that I was trying to say about um, love first and foremost and the sacrifice that love makes and also about communism and about the strength of the people who live under under the yoke and still manage to come up and be strong and and also about the price of sacrifice that that to build Leningrad on the blood and the backs of its people was a tremendous sacrifice mm. And the question is, was it worth it? Because now we have this city that stands on the banks of a gorgeous river, the Venice of the North, they call it, was it worth it? And uh, the question, of course, I ask in my book isn't, was it worth building Leningrad? But Leningrad is a symbol, was it worth, was it worth to bring communism to the Soviet Union at the expense of the people who live mm. under communism? Was it worth it to sacrifice? In our, in, a, in, the, in the personal destiny of the characters. Um, so what's your answer to that question, having posed it? Tragically, it was worth it. Mm. Because the book, in the end, does have a profound message of hope. And it's the hope that, despite the fact that it's, you know, it's a tragedy, but it does have that message of that a better life is possible. Mm. I wouldn't have been able to write that book had I myself not made it to America, you know. No, no. Or had I not gone back to Russia. Well, I was going yeah. to ask you about that because you obviously had to go back to research the book so, yeah. and that must have been very emotional and very mm -hmm. confronting for you. What was it like? And did you still have relatives left behind that yes. you could go and stay with and visit? Yes, relatives. Well, I, I did not stay with the relatives, but we certainly visited them. My father stayed with his lifelong friends. Uh, that trip I took, I took with my father. And, you know, when I went back to see Russia that I remember as a child, but now with grown-up eyes, and this is nine years, eight years after communism had fallen, um, have there been changes? Are the people living a different life? What does Leningrad look like to an adult? What does my apartment look like that I was born and raised and lived in? What do the streets look like? What are the people like? And, you know, you go there and you realize that they're living that same life. It's almost as if, it's almost if you go back in that, in that dream into a nightmare where mm. you've gone back in time and you see them all shuffling away, bleak, hopeless, and they're the, the same. And these aren't remote people, they're not strangers, they're people that, they're my, my best friend from childhood is there, my father's lifelong friends in the same rooms the communal apartment that we lived in, there are people still living there that we knew that we had grown up with. They are now living under a different regime and that regime has not brought them the things that it promised. So capitalism or the transition, the very uncomfortable transition to, to capitalism for the Russians has been a terrible, terrible experience and has brought them lower than anyone could ever have imagined and increased suffering in a way that people couldn't imagine. So do you feel 
jaundiced about capitalism and how capitalism has translated to the Russians? Not at all. I feel jaundiced even more about communism and the fact that it impoverished and made bankrupt the country with so many natural resources and such an indomitable spirit that seven years of communism cannot be undone by capitalism in seven years. That's what I think. I think that, that it is it is the tribute to the people that they're still somehow going on without hope because they almost can't imagine a different life unlike me who now has a different frame of reference but you cannot teach people to live one way and have four generations of soviets living one way and then suddenly take that way away and say well now see if you can do differently and besides the government has no money that is the government cannot do anything about that. Mm -hmm. They cannot make a profit. They are bankrupt. They cannot pay its people. That has... They, they simply don't know how to turn over a profit in that country. And there is no Western investment. The people aren't working. Nobody is building. Nobody is going in there and putting a stake in their, in their ground saying, this is going to be my land and I'm going to work for it. They don't know how to do that. All they do is grow their vegetables in the backyard and hope I don't even know for, for what, you know? And you also realize that the problems are so endemic, so fundamental, that to throw money at it, to, uh, to throw training at it, to throw courses at it, uh, it is not going to change mm -hmm. what's going on in Russia and will continue to go on for, I'm sure, a number of years. Though nobody's getting arrested and thrown into uh, jail, so that might be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Although crime <laughs> has gone up, I have to say. Yes. But then it's uh, then it's your personal choice instead of you know uh, political it, it's different. Yeah, and there was plenty of crime in Russia before. There was murder and robbery and and embezzlement on the scale that you cannot imagine. Uh, it was just all swept under the rug. Yes. And, yeah. Now, of course, the Russians and particularly the people of St. Petersburg have um, it almost genetically hardwired into them. I think to endure great hardship, and you use that um, will to survive mm -hmm. wonderfully in The Bronze Horseman because you have the backdrop of the Siege of Leningrad mm -hmm. for the main love story. Mm -hmm. What is it about the siege that interested you so much, apart from the fact that it is just such a horrific blockade and so many people lost their lives? Mm -hmm. Well, two things. I, I was fascinated by that subject from, uh, from an early age because my family had lived through it and my grandfather had lived through it. My grandmother's family had all perished during the siege. Um, my parents, my father were, you know, was evacuated with his brother to the Urals during that time. And it's just very prevalent in your thoughts as a Russian. So that was one thing. And the second thing was that most Americans and most Westerners, really, I would say most of the people who would read my book know very little about yes. the siege. It's not something that's... The Blitz, yes. You know, the, um, the 1948 blockade of Berlin, yes. Um, the war generally, perhaps, the Pacific War, the Asian War, the German War, yes. But the Russian War... Why? Then. Why do you think that is? Because I think you're absolutely right. I think there's just been a, a paucity of information coming from the East to the West about it. I mean, I don't think Russians wanted to expose exactly how many people had died and suffered. That siege would not have been possible in the West. Nobody else would have sacrificed the whole city in order to, in order to keep the Germans at bay. Yet Stalin did. Stalin made that decision. If, if he wanted to, he could have dropped food on Leningrad. The food mm -hmm. was not dropped. He could have gotten the food to Leningrad. He could have diverted more of his armies uh, to uh, get the Germans away and to, and to break the blockade. But that wasn't done because he did not value human yeah. life and communism could not possibly value human life as as they had shown it so he was just an extension of of kind of of the philosophy so um and so beca because of that because of that rarity of what had happened and the po and the and the um lack of information on it i thought it would be an interesting setting and because I had a personal connection to mm. it and a personal feeling I thought maybe there was a way to... So the, sh the most sense. shocking statistic I guess about the siege is that out of the three million people who lived in the city two million died. Right. What did the million do to survive? How did people survive the siege? The worst winter was the first winter. After that they were prepared and so they grew their vegetables right 
in the city and in the gardens, and so they were able to at least have potatoes and cabbage that uh, tided them over. Uh, and that's how they were able to. But the, wor the first winter, the way they survived is many of them did not. Some of them got evacuated across the lake. I described that across the road of life. My grandfather himself survived because my his mother-in-law, my great-grandmother, my maternal great-grandmother, went across the Neva and got him potatoes from the people that she used to live with and came back and and uh yes, and use that in the book and i use that in the book i mm -hmm. did that she was one time good to the people who um now were helping her mm -hmm. and these farmers but you yeah. give other examples of what people will do when they're in a state of such hunger and near famine mm -hmm. including licking wallpaper to get Potato, potato starch. Yeah, the potato starch from the glue that, yes. not even caring that the glue itself is a, is, is a poison, but... Um, and people ate rats? Uh, yes, but rats cleverly, because rats are very smart, they left the city <laughs> right before the worst. When they realized there was no more food in garbage cans, all right. the rats left, left the city. But no dogs, no, no cats, of course, existed in the city at that And time. you suggest in one very brief moment that cannibalism was also an option. Yes, and, and um, mothers who had children, who had young children, often would either uh, kill someone to feed their children. That's what they would do because it was it was the the mother lioness thing trying to make their children live. And it was often, of course, with men who ran around in gangs. My great grandmother was one of ten, and her only sister was um, was eaten during the siege. Yeah, her, all her brothers died in the war during during that time, but she herself perished. You know, and you think, and you live, we live our life, and but it's still in you, inside there. My grandparents, my parents still live with it. It doesn't leave them. I think much like, you know, the Holocaust, it can't really leave you. You kind of carry it with mm. you. you but know. it seems to me, having visited Leningrad when it was Leningrad, and St. Petersburg, and St. Petersburg, that these things are very present in the lives of people who live in that city, that you can still see facades with bullet holes in them, and people will still talk to you about the family relatives that they mm -hmm. lost during the siege. Absolutely. It, it seems not yet to have been put in the drawer of the past. No. It seems to be just yesterday. Why is it so fresh in people's and minds? Vivid. I mean, why are the memorials still so well kept and the flowers on them are brought every Sunday? Why do people still weep their memories of that event as if it had happened a few years ago? I mean, it's it's phenomenal. They will forget about Stalin's gulags, but they don't forget about what Hitler uh, did and the sacrifice that the Soviet Union made in order to in order to stop to stop him. Isn't that? I know. It's it's like in America we've gone on. In Texas we barely know when the when the when the war took place. <laughs> you know, in Australia, of course, Australia has been so peaceful basically all of its history. Mm. I mean, all of it was um, really happening on on someone else's shores mm. so you don't have that feeling of immediacy mm. whereas in Russia I think it's because the war was f literally fought on the backs and the soil and the thing is the bones of the people are in the earth yes. and so all of that you know comes back up do you know that there was there was a place in Russia where so many people had died that the bullets that had that are in their bodies and that have entered the earth and are lying in the earth make it impossible for anything to grow on that soil to this day to this day nothing can grow there because the hitler's bullets are still uh embedded in the people that he killed i mean it's just you know you kind of once you're walking on that soil i think you almost can't help but but mm, viscerally feel i think mm. for uh for that memory I wanted to ask you something about the love story at the center of the Bronze Horseman because it is a, a very passionate story. Initially it's a story which is about, again, denial, betrayal, secrecy, all sorts of cover-ups cover have to take have to take precedence over the passion that these two people uh, feel for each other, Tatiana and Alexander, the Red Army officer, uh, who is in fact dating Tatiana's sister. Uh, but eventually without giving too much away, these two people do get to have a relationship. And it's a very, very sexual 
relationship that you describe. I mean, they don't just get together, consummate their relationship and move on. Off camera, so to speak. Well, they don't do that off camera. They do it right there right in there, front of us. Right there. And they don't just do it once, do they? They have a lot of sex. A lot. Why did you dwell so much for a really large chunk of the book on the sexual relationship between those two people? On the passion between them and the passion was transferred, you know, in that way. I described their, in, you know, I showed their intimacy in all kinds of ways. That was one of the ways that their intimacy showed itself. Um, that part of the book, I think, is one is probably the most important, actually, part of the whole book for me, and one of the reasons why I wrote the book because that was the part that showed you how hard it was to get to that point that they what they had. Remember, they could only have because think of how much had to happen and how many people had to die and and what they had to go through in order to have that and little guilt and that little chunk of time together that privacy was removed from the soviet people because we all lived in conditions where our parents our grandparents our children all slept in the same room how is it ever possible again to to have it and yet in the west we completely take for granted that sexual privacy that passion mm. that we have with our partners and that experience of that life force of that life giving force after the death force that was the siege of Leningrad I thought was pivotal to the understanding of kind of what the war communism had taken away from the Russian people mm. Once upon a time, I think every Russian would have known at least part of the Bronze Horseman by Pushkin by heart. But now Russians appear to be reading less and taking less pride in their culture. They seem to be completely mesmerized by American films and Western culture. Does that sadden you? It saddens me a little bit, but American films is, you know, at least they bring to Russia some entertainment. Russian films are very bleak with no hope at all and never a happy ending. <laughs> But they are vastly interested, but they've always been very interested. I think just now there is more information, more American music coming across, and uh, they just they just love that because it's not their own. Mm. It, it does sadden me a little bit, but I have to say most Russians still love to write their own poetry. When I came there, I saw that they were all giving me their poems and 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 quoting little bits and pieces from Pushkin. So. Um, it's such a beautiful city, Paulina. I mean, it's, it, it really is very much the Venice of the North. It's such a glorious and romantic city. Could you imagine living there now under the non-communist system? Do you ever think, I might buy myself a little corner of St. Petersburg so I have this forever for myself and my family to remind us of where we came from? Leningrad lives with me, breathes with me, walks with me every day of my life. I never put it far away from me. It's just something that I recognize without being in denial that it is something part of what I am and who I am. I would never be able to live there having been accustomed to to things because you then will continue to live in denial but more so how selfish of me. I have three children and one on the way, how could I deny them what my father sacrificed his whole other family in order to give us, um, to give us a better life. And if the whole point is to give future generations of Russian Americans a better life, then going back to Russia is never going to do it now. But however, investing in Russia is going to do it. Uh, renovating Russia is going to do it. Perhaps perhaps bringing some of the people over to America to show them that another life is possible could do it. But I think my own, if I left there, I think my, 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 my children don't even want to go to a beautiful place like Australia. They're like, we're not leaving. What, are you kidding me? I'm like, what about those snakes you told us about? We're not going. <laughs> In Russia, there are no snakes, but there's that bitter cold and such poverty. And Tell us about the fact that you have now written a sequel and also I gather a prequel and a movie script of this story so you just can't let it go can you <laughs> I wasn't able to let it go then I've now I'm on to hopefully you know then the next thing but 
Uh, Why a prequel yeah. then? Where will the prequel take us back to? Oh, the prequel is going to be Tatiana's life. It's a story of Tatiana meeting evil for the first time when she is nearly 14 years old during her summer in Luga. So it's going to be a story of her and her brother and her sister. So we're going to get to see all of them still alive and loving each other and, and um, intact and knit, tight knit, you know, everything's still before they knew, yeah. Be mm -hmm. Well, before they know what's ahead. I mean, you will still see those you know, glimpses into communism, but 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 mostly very reduced to kind of that summer where Tatiana herself, for the for the first time, gets t to look into the eyes of the demon, so to speak. And with the sequel, Paulina, do you promise us a happy ending? Do you believe in happy endings? I do <laughs> believe in happy endings. And I would say that if you are patient, I think you will be amply rewarded. <laughs> but you must be, you must have the patience of a saint. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my virtue. I have to say I'm very impatient. But I said, well, I said to my publisher, I said, what would you like? Would you like one book, 1,300 pages long, or would you like two books, 550 pages long? And she unequivocally said two books. Right. So... So we have to wait. So you'll have a trilogy. It'll be like a Star Wars trilogy. <laughs> um, Paulina Simons, thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And Paulina Simons' epic love story, The Bronze Horseman, is published by HarperCollins. And I look forward to your company next time we meet on Talking Books. Mm -hmm.